Good evening to you all. Nice to see you all in this evening. A uh, very warm welcome. Sorry if you're getting a bit of a bright screen where you are. I can't quite see what I'm up to at the minute because the sun is shining directly uh, to where I would be looking to see how the picture's coming out. But we'll press on. The sound is the important thing I and mean, I believe we have that. So that's good. I trust you've had a good afternoon uh, together. This morning we received, or at least it came through last night properly, a uh, prayer letter from, or newsletter from Heather, uh, which she's been sending out to various of the Torch folks. I guess I'm an honorary member these days. Uh, one or two of us have received it. But in the midst of it, she mentioned a verse, a uh, passage that was precious to her mother, and uh, it struck a chord with me as well. It says in Psalm 91, He who abides, uh, dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the fat snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His troop shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks, that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. The Lord is the shadow. I was thinking as she was reading that, Hillary, you definitely need the video. So she, she reads my lips. Uh, so I'm in trouble if I say anything I shouldn't, aren't I? And the rest of you don't hear it. There we are. Uh, so it's uh, good that we can think of that this evening though being in the shadow of the Almighty under the shelter of his wing what a wonderful picture a beautiful picture that is and we've seen that in nature but we know that in practice ourselves well as we come together this evening let's commence by committing our time together with the Lord in prayer Lord we thank you this evening that we are able to think of ourselves taking shelter in you Lord we take shelter under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, if you should look at us as we would have deserved, uh, Lord, you would have had to have destroyed us. Uh, Lord, there would be nothing truly left of us. Lord, that it reflects your glory. Lord, a dead soul as such. And yet, Lord, that awareness still being ongoing in that place of hell. And yet, Lord, the night we come so familiarly to the God of heaven so freely to the God of heaven because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin and Lord not only have you cleansed us but you've clothed us fit to come this evening Lord no matter what we are wearing on our outward person Lord you've clothed us in the righteousness of Christ no matter what our life testimonies may say Lord our testimony with you is that of Christ Lord, we thank you for your perfect love of us. Thank you, Lord, for clothing us in this righteousness. We thank you, Lord, too, that you've made us precious promises. But as we continue on in our lives, Lord, though the world around us is, is struggling in the present, day by day, Lord, we be renewed in the hope of the future that is set before us in Christ, that one day we shall be glorified with him. Lord, we need your help to continue to press on in these days to continue to press forward with yourself lord in these difficult days in these hard days lord that you would be close to us but also draw us nearer to yourself continue lord to call us from heaven's courts that we may realize and recognize our home is not in this world we are just passing through Lord, if this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. There is treasure that is laid up in heaven, the treasures of Almighty God provided for us. Lord, we do not trust in you for the things you present us with. We trust in you, Lord, because of you. Lord, if we were to trust in things, we would think of them in terms of what we have now, perishing things, temporary things. But Lord, you are the eternal God. You are the unchanging God. Lord, nothing will fade with you. Nothing will decompose with you. Nothing will alter with you. Our salvation is secure in you. Our walk with you is secure because of your strength. And our eternity is secure because of your eternality. 
Lord, and our holiness is secure because of your perfection. Lord, if we should have to live the Christian life by our own strength and ability and not have the presence of the Spirit of God, we would all fall and fail. But by the grace of God, we are what we are. Lord, thank you for those mercies which have been new again today, refreshing our hearts, refreshing our souls. Lord, we come again this evening, in this evening hour, for the same again, Lord, refresh our souls. Strengthen us, Lord, according to our need in this time, that we may know grace and favour from our God. We pray, Lord, for those who are particularly going through trials, and we do think, Lord, of Jill and John Almond this week, Lord, as Jill will go for an operation, that, Lord, you will be with her, and you will grant her peace, and John, too, as he has to stand by. Lord, you would be with them both. Thank you, Lord, that we continue to have a health service that is doing so much to continue on with the necessary work it needs to do. Lord, may you continue to help all those who serve you in that as Christians. But Lord, they may do so in the hope and the assurance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, again, that you would be with them as their strength and their help. We thank you, Lord, for the recovery we've known Thomas and Anna Marin. Lord, we pray for others who may be going through similar circumstances. Lord, you would be with them. For those who are fearful of catching this disease, that, Lord, you would give them peace of mind and heart to know, Lord, that still all things, including this, work together for the glory of God, that you will not give us more than we can bear, but according to your spirit and your grace, you will prove yourself again sufficient. Lord, be with us all. Thank you, Lord, for our opportunities to praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to read your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear your word. Lord, may you use all these means. We ask in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Well, we do have... Oh, dear, the screen is really gone. I hope Hillary can still hear me. Uh, I don't know if there's anything I can do about that at the moment. Hang on. Let me see if there's anything I can do about it at the moment. Yes, I can. Uh, da -da 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 -da. It's not wonderful what you can do with technology. There we are. Oops, wrong way. I have to shift the other way, but I can shift the camera. Things you have to do. If I don't do that, I won't be able to see what I'm going to sing. So there we go. Right. That confuses you all now, but it's amazing. Just move a little camera and everything gets sorted. The hymn I've chosen for this evening is like a river glorious like a river glorious there's another hymn uh, later on here are the words for those who need them hillary's got a choice now she can either read the words or read my lips i'm not sure the words will match my lips but i'll do the best i can like a river glorious is god's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase perfect yet it floweth fuller every day perfect yet it groweth deeper all the way stayed upon jehovah hearts are fully blessed finding as he promised perfect peace and rest hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand never fall can follow never traitor stand we may trust him fully or for us to do they who trust him wholly Find him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Well, as we continue, let me give you a few announcements. I mentioned there in prayer, uh, we have Bernard has heard from John and Jill uh, Almond over in Leeds uh, working with Caring for Life and they were members of the fellowship here in Chorley for a considerable time before moving over in that direction 
Uh, we've heard that Jill will be having her operation on Wednesday. On Wednesday, so please remember them in prayer. Remember the surgeons as they conduct that operation. She should just be in overnight and then return home and being looked after from home. Uh, she's going to be having uh, breast surgery and lymph node surgery. Uh, so that is the procedure to deal with the cancer that she has. I uh, also mentioned for those who maybe weren't tuned in this morning that Anima has returned home. We're really pleased to hear that. That's wonderful news to have heard that. Heard that. We also heard that the container has arrived in Tanzania just next to uh, let me remember the name of the place, Malawi, and uh, so do pray for Lapson as he awaits that coming back into the in, into the country, and uh, that all that would go well, uh, that everything would be transferred in, and all would work out well. I think that's just about everything uh, to remember. Of course, you'll all be tuned in when the uh, Prime Minister makes his statement tonight, but don't worry, the BBC will re-inform you and uh, you'll be able to catch up. So uh, I'm sure there'll be nothing that's going to be earth-shattering from what we gather thus far. I'll be wrong, proved wrong if that happen, uh, happens other ways. I know that some of you have missed uh, singing the hymns, I know that. Um, I hope you, I know you appreciate what I'm doing and thank you for that. I do not find that easy amongst all these other things. Nevertheless, thank you for that. If you would like to follow along with words, for those of you who are sighted, um, sorry, it doesn't work with those of you who are not, uh, but there are other means available, I'm sure. Uh, new, Christian hymns, and you just have to have put Christian hymns in, certainly for the Android store, and that's the Play Store that you get your apps through on your Android phone, and there is one for iTunes and that other system of Apple as well. Uh, you can put Christian hymns in, and there is an app that has our hymn book on it. I haven't done it, they produced it themselves, and it has the hymns and it has some music. Now, I have to say the music's not great, uh, but it, it'll get you started if you want to try and sing to yourself and do. But if you want to follow along the words, there are the words, it's available free, except for some of the hymns, there's not the music with them because they're under copyright and you have to pay, pay a small fee of 99p, I think it is, to get the other ones released uh, because of the copyright. But that's there available. It also includes with it Sing Psalms, which some of the hymns and the psalms are included in the New Christian Hymns as we'll be using this morning for the first hymn. And that was, uh, someone asked, what was the tune? And the tune was Resignation. That was not a preliminary to what I would be doing. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the name of the hymn, Resignation. And uh, you won't know what that was. There we are. That's all the analysis I can think of at the moment. As we continue on, we come to our children's talk. And there we are. We've got a Christian again, and he's still in the interpreter's house. How much longer will he be here? Well, you've got at least two more weeks in the interpreter's house, God willing, and uh, then he'll proceed forth to the most wonderful place. Well, the most wonderful place on this earth for anyone to proceed forth to. There's the interpreter's house for the children, still that house that we've been in for so long. And here we are again in this house. But this view is different. This time Christian is again taken by the hand. But he's not taken into a room. This time he's shown something. It's not a different room he's taken in, not seeing a picture on a wall as he did at first, or a fireplace as he did on the last occasion. But this time he sees... A palace, a vast palace. This palace was beautiful, more beautiful than the palace in the picture. The palace in the picture is the uh, castle at Windsor, in which the queen has got a small bedroom at the moment and she's just looking after herself there. It looks a very lovely place to be, doesn't it? I'm sure she is uh, much appreciating the care she's getting, but the palace in Pilgrim's, and Pilgrim's Progress and Christian's eyes it was a palace of fine precious stones and fine gold. It was a beautiful in appearance. It was a very pleasant place in which Christian was stood, but that place was most precious. As he looked upon it, he saw upon the walls, as you can see ramparts there, the walls at the top, he could see people walking. And he noticed that they were dressed in gold. Their clothing was of gold. 
It was fine gold. It shone with its purity and its beauty. And he was amazed. He took in this sight. He was so amazed by it, he asked the interpreter, Can we go in? He was excited to find out more about this city and to know more about it. But the interpreter said nothing to him. He simply took him by the hand and he took him to the gate of the palace. There's the gate of Windsor Castle. And some of you might have seen that in person. And he took him round to this gate. Christian looked at the gate. It was indeed an impressive sight, but there were other things to see here. The one thing was there was a man sitting at a table, a registration table, a table where people would come and put down their names so that they might enter into the city. And there the man sat. It was free for anyone to come and to have their name written down. The Christian noticed that not many people were doing so. And then when he looked further, he realized the reason why some of them were not doing so. They seemed to want to enter the city, but at the city gate, there were many armed men. They had swords and various implements to stop people from getting into the city. They were determined to stop them, determined to stop them making their entrance. And so when people came to the table and wanted to enter the city, they were put off. They didn't want to go and face these men, so they didn't go and get their names put down. Yet they stood around and, and they kind of wanted to go, but, but they, oh, they daren't. As Christian looked, he became quite discouraged at this, but then there came a man, just one. He stepped up boldly, came to the table and he said, put my name down. And so it was that the scribe, the man, put his name down on the page. And as soon as it was down, this man was clothed in armour. He pulled down his helmet, he drew out his sword, and he stepped forward. He went forward, and he was cutting and beating and crushing down and knocking down. And he kept going through, making his way always to the gate. He was determined to get through the gate. He was not going to turn right or left. He was going through that gate. As he did so, he heard a cry from within the gate. Come in, come in, and you shall gain eternal glory. And so it was. The man struck down the last of his enemies and he entered in. He went into the gate and there was heard the most beautiful rejoicing. As the man received new clothing, new raiment, thus like the people who he had seen, a Christian had seen on the wall, golden clothing, pure clothing, beautiful clothing. And the man entered in to the joy of that city. Christian turned to interpreter and he said, I think I know what this means. I can see what this means. It must be time for me now to continue my journey, to take my leave of you and to be going. But the interpreter turned to him and said, No, not yet. I still have a little to show you. And we'll find out a little of what he has to show him. But there it is, a picture of heaven was the palace. It was a picture of the place that we're going to. Heaven isn't a palace, it's more than a palace. It's more splendid. The hopes of the Christian are more splendid, more beautiful than that. But it's an open gate that anyone can go through. But we have to make sure that our names are put down, registered. It says in the Bible that God has a book. And in that book, he puts the name of those who he has chosen to be Christians. He writes down their names. And it's put in the book, which is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And there are their names, all the names of the people that God truly knows to be Christians are written in that book. And these people, when their name, they come to know their names are written in that book, they are told by the Bible that we should get ready for battle. Because there's all kinds of pe things and people that don't want us to go to heaven. They think they could go to a heaven, maybe some of them, that's so wonderful and beautiful without going in this way. But we know we have to go by the gate that God provides. And it needs us to be clothed in armour, and to be willing to fight. Seems a strange thing to say because fighting's not really good, is it? But this is a good fight. A fight to enter in to heaven itself. Not that we can earn being in heaven. That's already done in Lord Jesus. But nevertheless, it's hard to be a Christian. 
And it's like a fight, a fight to get into heaven itself. But we know that we will be there because God has written our names in his book and we know that he will have us in his heaven. One more day, boys and girls, I really hope that you will know that God has put your name in his book. And maybe at times you'll, you'll wander or you'll struggle as a Christian, but you'll be reminded that God has got your, na his na your name in his book and you will be there in his presence. Well, we'll learn a little bit more of that in a moment or two with the adults and what this all means as we put it in the context of the Bible. And to do that, we need to turn to the Bible and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians, uh, not 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6 through to 21. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 21. The Apostle Paul writes, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, laid hold of eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things that and before Christ who witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until the day until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they, be, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen, indeed. Well, we're going to be looking together at the Pilgrim's Progress and these words again. Come in, come in, eternal glory you shall win, are the words which were heard by Christian from within the city. And uh, we're looking this evening about fighting the good fight from those words, the need to fight the good fight. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life to which you are called. Of course, last Friday, the 8th of May, marked the 75 years since the day that Britain and the Commonwealth celebrated victory in Europe. Back in 1945, on the 8th of May, King George VI said, Today we give thanks to God, to Almighty God, for a great deliverance. His concluding words of his speech were these, In the hour of danger we humbly committed our cause into the hand of God, and he has been our strength and shield. Let us thank him for his mercies 
and in this hour of victory commit ourselves and our task to the guidance of that same strong hand. There was on the balcony of Buckingham Palace that day a man who was not a member of the royal family, who stood in the midst of the royal couple, the queen and her and the king, and her two daughters, Elizabeth, who is now our queen. There was a man who stood in the midst, his name Winston Churchill, a man well recognised. Following the World War though, Winston Churchill was voted out of power along with his party uh, and he didn't remain Prime Minister. So another government came in for which we are grateful because today we have an NHS that came out of that time and we are grateful for that. But a few years later when it came time to vote again, Winston Churchill again was voted in as Prime Minister of this country. 1951 he was voted in. Uh, in the times previous he, he'd given a few lectures, plenty of lectures actually, and been asked to give speeches. And I think it's one of the speeches that he uh, gave these words, words which were quite familiar in part from the time of the World War. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honour and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Never give in. Never give in. But when Winston Churchill returned to power, as I said, as the Prime Minister, he was a different man. Or at least something different was about the nation at that time. There was a real sense of despondency. Some of you can remember that, and I certainly can't, but some of you remember that. And as Prime Minister in his time of service this second time, there was something that happened in this country that brought for a moment a time of hope. It came with the arrival of a, a preacher from the United States by the name of Billy Graham. He came to London to conduct a campaign in London, a, mi a mission in London, which many thousands of people attended. And many were born again, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour. It made such an impact that Billy Graham was invited to meet Winston Churchill and he was asked to come to 10 Downing Street and speak with Churchill, which he accepted. On the day in question he arrived at the office of Winston Churchill and the secretary reminded him very clearly that Winston Churchill only has 20 minutes. He was very aware that his time with Winston Churchill would be very short. When Billy Graham walked into the room, he was motioned by Churchill to come and take a seat with Churchill with his customary cigar in his hand and motioned him to sit down. He then congratulated Billy Graham on the vast crowds that had been attending his crusade. He said to Billy Graham, I dare say if I had brought Mar Marilyn Monroe over here and she and I together had went to Wembley, we couldn't fill it. What is it then night after night? that fills that place. Billy Graham said, I think it's the gospel of Christ. I tell you, said Mr. Churchill, I see no hope for the world. I am a man without hope. Do you have any real hope? He asked Mr. Graham. Well, Mr. Graham was not one to miss an opportunity. And he said, after asking the Prime Minister if he had any hope for his own soul's salvation, he went on to share the gospel with him. You know, Winston Churchill was a great example of determination during the war that we had to fight. He encouraged, he stirred up the people to fight. His speeches moved them to continue on and urged them to continue on. He played a key role in, in seeking to get people moving forward and, and driving them forward and encouraging them forward. And yet now here in this room with Billy Graham, he sat as a man without hope as Billy Graham began to share the gospel with him. The Christian though is very different. We have set before us a living hope. Winston Churchill's hope during the Second World War, he knew what he was aiming for. But once war had ended, it was again trying to make something that could never be and not really knowing what that should be. 
But the Christian doesn't have that. The Christian has a real, a living hope to press on towards. And both John Bunyan and the Apostle Paul point out both to the, uh, Christian, to the Christian that there is the fruition of eternal hope. But in between that fruition and now, there is also a fight of faith for the Christian to be engaged in. That is exactly what the Apostle Paul calls it, the fight of faith, the good fight of faith. We want to consider for a little while this evening, what form does the fight of faith take, the good fight of faith take? The first form it takes is the form that we see laid out before us in 1 Timothy 2 Timothy. As Paul writes to this younger Christian, encouraging him forward in the fight of faith. He speaks about the struggle of conflict, and it is one which Bunyan points out comes at the entrance. It is the struggle of conflict at the entrance. And then we should look at ourselves and consider this, how we must are urged to join in this fight by entering into the striving of conflict. So first... The struggle of conflict at the entrance. We are told that this is a good, uh, I'm moving thought too far forward, that there are pleasures to be fled, first of all at the entrance to this fight. Bunyan describes how many people stood around. They could see the beauty of the city in front of them, the beauty of the palace. They could see the beauty of the raiment of the people who entered into it. They could see all the good and the wonderful things. But if they were to enter into that city, they had to leave where they were and they had to go forward. They had to write down, have their names written down and fight. But they were not ready to do so. They were unprepared to leave what they had, to risk losing everything in order to gain entrance to that palace and so they stood around looking talking about other things but would not go forward they were unprepared to turn their back on life and go forward in battle now paul urges timothy that he must flee those things there are pleasures to be fled there are things that must be left behind. Whether we leave them behind in the immediate moment when we become a Christian, or whether we leave them behind at the end of our journey, it makes no difference. They must be left behind. They must be finished with. They are loosely held. They must be pressed on towards. See, there are those, as Paul says, who suppose that they could reach heaven but they could have a form of God worship that meant that they could get rich in life, that they could continue to grow in wealth and grow in all the things of this world, that God didn't intend them to suffer. He didn't want it to be hard work for them. He just wanted them to be blessed. We hear this a lot today. God doesn't intend you to suffer. God doesn't intend you to do this. God intends you to be rich. Look what God has done to my life, how I have prospered in God's hand. And you hear people say things like that. Paul doesn't say that. Paul says that we are to flee the pleasures of this world. There are those who use their godliness and think it is that by that that they will grow rich. They have fallen in love with rich riches. There are others who simply want to be rich. That doesn't mean that they want an extortionate amount of money. They may want just the settledness of the life that they consider to be brought about by money. And by this, says the Apostle Paul, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows and many concerns. They hold on to these things rather than putting down their names as Bunyan described Christian doing and fighting. So there are pleasures to be fled. There is also a pursuit to be engaged in. Not only things to be turned their back upon, but there is a pursuit to be gain, engaged in. There was this one man now who stepped forward. He was going into that city. He was determined that he should be there. There was his riches. There was what he wanted. He wanted to be in that place. The promises of that place were in his mind, in his heart. He wanted to go there. He came to the table determined, put my name down, he said. And thus he took up his sword and he went forward. He was prepared to fight and he was requested that his name be put down. 
Paul was there when Timothy did that. He says he remembers the occasion when Timothy, before many witnesses, confessed a good confession. He confessed that he was going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I suppose in theory this could be his baptism. It's certainly an occasion where many make that kind of confession as adults when they are baptized, as we do in the in church by immersion. Confessing by their testimony that I am turning my back on the world and I am going forward with the Lord Jesus Christ that the old me has died and the new me is coming to life in Christ and I therefore set my mind to go forward. There is a confession of this. I am going forward. Here is the pursuit of my life. I want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, eternally present with him. And there is the confession. Paul is concerned that he should continue this confession in his life, but he is, there is where he has made it. He says that this fight involves a pursuit it is a pursuit to be engaged in. It is namely pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ. It is pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ in two ways. One, he has gone ahead of us. So we are coming after him. We are pursuing him. We are coming behind him. He has risen from the dead. He has entered into glory. And we too can join with him when death, when death is brought to us and God determines, we too can be his presence. But there is also a fight in life. It is a pursuit of life, a pursuit of the character of Christ, to live by the same testimony and same manner as the Lord Jesus Christ did, as he set us an example to follow his character, to follow his example, and to seek to put into practice, seek also his nature to be placed into us. Not that we can become God, but by coming, seeking to be holy as God is holy. Without holiness, says God, no one shall see, without holiness, Paul says, no one shall see the Lord. We are to pursue holiness as we have seen it in Christ. We are to pursue the example of the Lord Jesus Christ as he set his face towards glory. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the fight. He pressed on for the glory set before him. And so too we are to pray. Paul encouraged Timothy to press on. Pleasures to be fled, pursuit to be engaged in. Thirdly, in the midst of this, there is a privilege to be sought. There came a cry from within the city, says Bunyan. Come in, come in, eternal glory you shall win. What a wonderful cry. Come in. The invitation, the welcome, the greeting of heaven. Isn't it amazing? the free offer of the gospel, that we can believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we can gain eternal life is an offer made to all mankind. The gate is open in that sense. It is made clear. But there are so few who seek to come into that. There are many who believe that somehow by ease they will enter into heaven. They will get there by their own way or their own working. It will kind of just happen. I am a Christian. But there is no engaging in this fight, no pursuit. Paul says that there's also therefore a privilege to be, uh, to be sought. The man heard of eternal glory within and he pressed on further. He went forward and he gained his reward. The utmost pleasure which Timothy is to fight towards, to press on in this fight of faith, is to behold the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. It's not the clothes that he will wear in glory. It's not the change and transformation of his being alone. It is to see and behold the Lord Jesus Christ. The privilege to be sought. No man can see God and no man has seen God at any time, we are told. To behold God is, would destroy us, would ruin us, because he is so holy, so pure. To be called God's children, therefore, and to be told that we shall one day see him, is the highest privilege that a human being can know and will experience through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a privilege to be sought. More than the treasure of this world, more than anything we can gain in this world, more than the promises that we think of the things in heaven according to the standards of this world. 
many think of the things of heaven in regard to the food and drink that they have, the clothing they wear now. But there is more to it than that. It is the manifestation of Christ, a privilege to be sought. Paul then says that there is a struggle of conflict which we must enter into. Pleasures to be fled, a pursuit to be engaged in, and a privilege to be sought. Which brings us to probably the major part of what we are going to consider in this message, the entering into the striving of the conflict. Of conflict. My buttons are not working, I should have had that sign up before now, and never mind, entering. Entering the striving of conflict. Fight the good fight. Friends, it is a good fight. In war, there are always those who disagree with it. Some, rightly so, in instances. But there are always protests, there are always some who stand aside. Some for matters of conscience, many just because they don't think we should ever be at war. But we are told here it is a good fight. There are also those in times of conflict and war who say that they are unfit and are proved to be unfit. They have a heart problem, they cannot see to do certain things. There are various other reasons why a person may be declared unfit for service. But there is no such case here. This is a good fight, a fight which everyone must engage in as a Christian. There is only one choice here, fight or die. We might think, well, we were going to fight and face death. No, not in this case. It is a fight of faith for life, eternal life. If we do not fight for this, if we do not strive for this, we will die eternally, completely. It is a good fight. It's not like those fights at school where you stood aside like I did and I wasn't one for fighting and doing. I was never built for it and I certainly didn't have a mind for it. You didn't enter into those kind you didn't want to enter into those kind of fights, but this is a fight that everyone must enter into. It is something that must be done. It is a good fight. We don't think of fights in that way, but it is a good fight fight. It is a necessary, it is an essential fight. It is proper and right the Christian be engaged in this. It is also therefore a fight. It is not a garden party. It is not a sitting round in a picnic. It is not a shopping excursion. It's not anything else. It is a fight. There is armour to be worn. Bunyan describes his man as putting on, pulling down his helmet and getting his sword out. It is a fight to be engaged in. There is an armour and protection that is needed. And God provides that, as the Apostle Paul told the, the, Philipp, the Philippians, I believe, as he told them what to clothe themselves in. If it wasn't them, it was the Ephesians. Never mind. To wear the armour of God. To play, put it on. To have the helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. The sword of the spirit. The preparation of the gospel on their feet. And so forth and so on. There is armour to be worn in this fight. It is necessary. You don't go dressed to cook a cake on this fight. You go in armour prepared to fight. A sword must be drawn. And if it is drawn it must be used. It must be used to wound. To inflict wounds. To fight back. To defend. To keep going forward. It is to be pressed to the point where it hurts and wounds others. The sword of the spirit this is. Not a physical sword. Although it hurts much more than a physical sword I would suggest. For it cuts at that, those things which are really our enemies. And prevent, would prevent us from entering into glory. And it is energy that is needed. You don't fight lightly. Those who come and try and uh, just gently go, they're not going to last five seconds, are they? A fight is a fight. We know what it means. The earnest use of energy, strength and ability to do one's pursuit. And it seemingly doesn't matter who we are, that we can fight at some point. We will find a way. Many of us wouldn't realize our own strength or what we could do until we were presented with a danger. Spiritually, we all have to engage in this fight with the strength that we have. It is a good fight then. It is a fight. But it is a good fight of what? It is a good fight of faith. 
it is a good fight of faith. The writer of the Hebrews says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is a fight of faith. It is a fight in the belief and the knowledge there is a heaven to gain. There is a glory that is set before me, and I must press on towards it. In this I will face opposition. I don't want that opposition. I don't make that opposition. There just is opposition. It may be opposition of physical people, family, friends, who look down on my standing as a Christian. And I may have to fight against that by faith, holding that God will be near to me and God will keep me strong and God will help me. Their words may be cutting, they may seek to wound me and to hurt me, but I will trust in God by faith that I will continue on. It may be that in the workplace. I may be uh, shunned, ridiculed, by the majority of people, and I will have to stand by faith. I will have to use the sword of the Spirit to indeed strike at my enemies within my own mind and heart, bringing the Word of God before my mind, reminding myself that others have gone this way. The reading of that verse was taken from Hebrews 11, which is a record of those who have gone by faith, of whom some the world was not worthy. They didn't want to be here, to live here eternally. They were looking for something else. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and foundation builder was God, whose foundation was established in God. It says at the end of that chapter that all these, all those who are listed within this uh, 11th chapter of Hebrews, had a good testimony through faith and did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. They had the faith in the promise of God, that God would provide a Saviour, the Messiah, that he would come and redeem them, and they would gain the fulfilment of that promise, eternal life in the presence of God forever and ever. We have more than the promise. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who has died, risen, and ascended, and is returning. And we are assured of that promise in a way in which the Old Testament was not without the Spirit of God which moved in their hearts, of course. God has revealed himself to us. But it is not by the strength of our knowledge alone, nor our physical ability in spiritually fighting, as it were. It is a fight of faith. We must believe that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, as we seek to enter into the glory of our God. Of course we are saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are cleansed by, with, from our sin, but we are nevertheless called to fight the fight of faith. We are in a battle, says the Bible. It tells us that God, we were once at enmity with God. We were warring against God. But now we are on God's side. So the world is warring against us as it does God. We have changed our position. God has changed our position more rightly. And we must fight by faith. This is not a call to physical arms. This is a call to spiritual war, which is as real, more real, than that of the war of physical war. For those who can kill the body can only kill the body. But we are involved in a war that is about our soul, in the light of one who is able to kill both bo destroy both body and soul in hell's fire. It is a good fight, and it is a fight of faith. It is also an it intentional fight. Lay hold of eternal life to which you are called, says the Apostle Paul. You are to lay hold of it. You are to stretch towards it. It is the goal which you are to have in view. Paul told the Corinthians, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but 
I discipline my body, bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others I should myself be disqualified. Paul speaks of the fight of knowing where we are going, the purpose of it. We desire that which God has promised to us. We will not have anything to separate us from that. None of these who stand between us and God should get in our way. They need to be removed from the way, separated from the way. We face them one by one and we are dist- they are all to feel the blade of the word of God as we use the promises of God and the pledges of God that they may be moved and removed from our path, that we may hear more and more that come in, come in and enter the glory of eternal life. Paul says of himself in his second letter to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Note how he puts it there. He has fought the good fight good fight and he has kept the faith and finally there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge will give me on that day and not only me he says but all who have loved his appearing all who have looked towards god all who have set their mind towards glory who have fought the fight of faith he will receive the crown that is promised to them not only then is it an intentional, a good, a fight, a good fight, a fight, and the fact. Let me remember what it said. It's a fight of faith and an intentional fight. It is also a continuing fight. Paul reminds Timothy, "You confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You confess this once. Are you still in the fight, Timothy? Are you still fighting?" Are you still pressing on? Are you still aiming for the the glory of heaven? Is your life going in that way? Now Paul knows that Timothy's life is, but he wants to urge his younger brother on and forward. Continue to fight. The Lord Jesus Christ reminded the church in the last book of the Bible that we are to be overcomers. To every one of the churches he said to them and promised to them, to him who overcomes. There is a world to be overcome. There are things to be placed under our feet, as it were. There are things to be struck down. Temptations that we must face, and they must be struck down. There are things that we withhold the joy of the Lord from us. They must be struck down. It is a fight. It is not easy to be a Christian. It is a calling to be a Christian. It is a calling by the grace of God that we are the children of God by grace alone, saved, not by works. But there is one who wants to separate us from our reward, the reward and inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an enemy that wants to defeat us and strike us down. Sometimes he takes those forms within family and friends and those around us. But sometimes he comes personally to us. We are to overcome. But we are more, my dear friends, than conquerors. It's what the Apostle Paul reminded the Roman church through him who loved us. Those in front of us, our enemies, our temptations, our fears, and all those things that must be overcome, they have already met their maker. They have met their master. They have met the Lord of Lord and Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and he has defeated them they inflict seek to inflict wounds they seek to strike at us still but Christ has defeated them all we are more than conquerors we come behind him who has conquered sin for us we come behind him who has defeated temptation for us we strike after him there's a picture within the bible of this in part and in the book of one samuel where jonathan the son of saul and his servant go over to the philistine camp and seeing the philistine camp jonathan says to his servant now follow me if the lord has handed these over to us then they will say to us come up and we will come up and i will strike them and you can finish off those that I have already defeated. In part, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. He goes ahead of us. 
he strikes our enemy. They're already defeated as they are falling towards us. And we, in part, finish them off in our own lives. We defeat them in our own lives, but he has already given them the blow that will defeat them by death. He has already crushed them. We are to overcome. We could be afraid of this fight and feel that somehow, well, because we are facing all these enemies, there is a possibility I could lose my salvation. It is not possible. The fight of faith clings to the Lord Jesus Christ. It follows on his coattails. It follows in his steps. He struck with his blow, his sword. A two-edged sword proceeds from him. The word of the Spirit destroys our enemies. As they seek to reach out to destroy us, they're already defeated. We only inflict the wound, add to the wounds which Christ has already mortally given to them, reminding them of what he has done to them and how they are destroyed. It is a good fight. It is a fight. It is one of faith. It is one of continu and it is one of continuing fight. In the words then of Winston Churchill, we should never give up. Never give up. This is what Paul's instruction is to Timothy. Never give up. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Look at what God has laid before you. Stretch out towards it. Take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And strike at your enemy. Never give up. In fact, Winston Churchill is also meant to have said these words. Never give up on something that you cannot, that you can't go a day without thinking about. Never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking about. I find those words challenging as a Christian. How much do I think about where I am going? I may think about where I am going temporarily. What is to happen within this next time period? What will be set aside in this next moment? But what about heaven? What about the glory that is set before us? The eternal life? Have we laid hold of it? If it was a rope that was hanging from a, a, a mountain and we were climbing up, have we got hold of it? Are we looking to where we are going? Or are we kind of trying to amble our way along? We will never reach heaven if we have such an attitude to the glory and splendor of God. We cannot have understood the wonder of our salvation if we can simply think about ambling along in our Christian life. It is a fight. We are not to give up. If we can go a day without thinking of the glory of God and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we must question ourselves whether we are truly a Christian. Because this is the fight of faith. And it's the only way sin will be overcome in our lives and the temptations we face will be overcome for the lives of others. When Billy Graham met, heard Winston Churchill say he had no hope for humanity, the truth is that Winston Churchill had fought for humanity. He had. He'd, he'd fought with the military forces and then he fought as the Prime Minister. But the prize he had fought for had disappointed him. There was a danger here, a danger which uh, John Bunyan also highlights is and it's the danger of being emotionally stirred up at this point to fight. John Bunyan says of Christian, I think that I know what this means. I think that it's time I continue my journey. No, said interpreter. I still have a little more to show you. Then you can continue your journey. And with a message like this, it's easy for us to get stirred up emotionally. Think of the glory of heaven. Think of the splendor that's ahead of us and think, oh yes, I must fight. But enthusiasm will not be enough. It will run out. It was, sadly, in the life of Winston Churchill. And it has in the lives of many who have reached that stage. They fought a fight. But those who followed on behind that fight haven't lived up to that standard. Remember what the king said? In the light of this victory which God has given, we should live our, our lives in the future. Have we managed to do that as a country? Certainly not. Is there any talk of God today? Any thought of God in the light of this uh, time and the situation we are in? Very little indeed. And even very little at times from the church of God 
himself. Enthusiasm is not enough. But eternal life, dear friends, the hope of eternal life will never disappoint. It will never disappoint. It will never disappoint all who fight to reach it. It's the only way. It's the only way. Set our eyes on those things above. Letting go of those things which are behind us. We press forward to the goal of the upward calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the God of heaven has called to our souls, telling us that we are the redeemed of God. Let us therefore press on boldly as we see the day of our Lord continuing on. Let us learn to wield the sword of his spirit, the word of God, wisely in our life. Let us protect our minds with the helmet of his salvation, that we may be assured of our walk and faith in God. For as the hymn writer says, we dare not trust the arm of flesh, for it will fail us. But God's spirit, in which our faith is, will never fail us. May the Lord help us to fight the good fight of faith. There are a lot of bad fights out there, but this is the good fight, the good fight of faith, and lay hold on eternal life. Let's pray. Lord God, many of us, by very nature, we're not fighting people. Lord, we not imagine ourselves hitting another individual, maybe losing our temper with someone, but even that might be a difficulty for us. Some of us, Lord, have suffered at the hands of those who've hurt us, and that has put us off the idea of, of fighting. And yet, Lord, we see here is a fight we can none of us run away from. It is the only fight that can truly be called a good fight. It's the fight for our lives. If Christ has redeemed and saved us, we, we want the reward of his sufferings for him. Lord, he should have the reward. And so, Lord, train us to fight this good fight of faith. Lead us as we fight this good fight of faith. That we may overcome those who would stand between us and our God. We may overcome individuals. We may overcome temptations. We may overcome circumstances. And whatever else is placed across our path. That we may fight for the glory of our God. And the honour of his name. Thank you Lord that your word has already provided for us those things which we need in this fight. Christ has defeated these enemies. Christ has conquered these enemies. Now we are more than conquerors. We come behind him. Lord, may we follow him closely. May we listen to how he defeated our enemies. And may we learn from him. May his character and nature and example be part of our being as we join this fight. And may we strengthen one another in the Lord. Lord, we are all weak in human flesh. Lord, may our encouragement be that we may cling to Christ, that we may pray for one another in the, for the Spirit of God to strengthen us. Lord, we thank you for that within the New Testament that tells us the Holy Spirit was given to strengthen your people as you had in times past in special ways. Lord, may you strengthen each of us in that er those areas we need as we press forward with the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, not to run on enthusiasm. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of today. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of your word and the, the encouragement it can be to us. But, Lord, may its enthusiasm alone not be what we take from this day. Lord, may we take from this day again a renewed dependence upon you. Lord, we may rest on you, our shield and our defender. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm sorry again for the technical difficulties of the light and all the rest of it, but I do not control the sunshine, surprisingly enough. But it has been good to be with you again today. I do have a hymn as we close again this evening. And it is Soldiers of Christ Arise and Put Your Armour On. Soldiers of Christ arise and put your armour on Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power Who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conquer I'll uh, take a drink of water for a new next verse. Stand then in his great strength, with all his strength endued, and take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. To keep your armour bright, attend with constant care, still serving in your captain's sight, and watching unto prayer. From strength to strength go on, wrestle and fight and pray. Tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well for day. That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may all come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. Well, thank you very much for tuning in today. I will remind you we're back again on Wednesday evening. If you do have any prayer points for that, please do let me know. Uh, by half six if you can on Wednesday evening. If you don't meet the deadline, don't worry about it. We can work that around that. It'd be great to have some prayer points to share. I will be sending out prayer news on Wednesday morning, probably as the usual. Uh, follow up and general prayer news of how things are going on. And that will be emailed out. I may also include the links to those apps I mentioned earlier on about the singing of hymns uh, somewhere around during the week. So keep an eye uh, to that as well if you're interested. But thank you very much for tuning in today. I trust the Lord has blessed you and will continue to bless you for the coming week. And we look forward to being with you again on Wednesday evening. God bless.